When Johnny Depp sued Amber Heard for defamation, his case brought a massive amount of public attention to the dirty secret of female perpetrated domestic abuse. But at the same time, because Johnny Depp is Johnny Depp, his experience and his circumstances are not necessarily going to be relatable to the thousands, if not millions, of average, everyday men who find themselves in abusive relationships. So I wanted to share with you a new case that I have been looking at that I think you'll find is a little bit better reflection of the average experience of a man trying to extricate himself from an abusive relationship. So I'm going to be introducing you to Johan Griffith and Alice Evans. This case first came across my radar about two years ago because there was a lot of public reporting about the split. Now, I had never heard of Johan Griffith or Alice Evans when I started seeing stories about this breakup. So I learned that Johan Griffith is a Welsh actor. He's probably best known for starring in Horatio Hornblower, uh, which is a British series. I never watched it, uh, but I do know that the original Horatio Hornblower was played by the greatest actor of all time, Gregory Peck. So pretty, pretty big shoes to fill there. And I learned that Alice Evans uh, also had appeared in some different films. Uh, she, I think, is best known for uh, a starring role in 102 Dalmatians. I also did not see that. Uh, but that is apparently where she and Johan Griffith first met. Uh, this was back in 2000. They had a relationship for several years, ultimately married in 2007, and had two children, their daughters, Ella and Elsie. So they had been married for approximately 13 years in 2021 when this very public split happened. So while I became aware of this story pretty early on in its public unfolding, it really didn't capture my interest right off the bat because it struck me as just a salacious tabloid story about a particularly nasty Hollywood adjacent celebrity breakup. And, you know, divorce law really isn't my thing. I'm just not, not that interested in it. It's not my bag. But when you do criminal defense work, you get an awful lot of experience with domestic abuse. Somewhere in the ballpark of 40 to 50% of all police reports are domestic violence related. It's an enormous part of your caseload. And so through that, you inevitably end up being intertwined with these other aspects of the justice system that deal with domestic relations. Your client's kids might be taken and put into foster care. Uh, they might have a, a dependency case going where your client is going to have to engage in certain services to remedy parental deficiencies to get access to their children. There might be situations where you have restraining orders, where you have pending divorce cases that can be affected by the outcome in your criminal case. So there's a lot of overlap there that sort of forces you to get familiar with how the domestic law system treats domestic violence. There's also the fact that as a criminal defense attorney, you tend to be alert to the circumstances that can tend to produce false accusations and particularly false accusations by children. It's always something uh, in criminal defense that you're going to be alert to and you learn a lot about the types of circumstances uh, that can tend to suggest that false accusations might be at play here. Things like parental alienation, uh, things like subjecting the children to, you know, suggestive and coercive types of circumstances uh, in, in order to, to manipulate them, to use them as a tool in this related dispute between the parents. 
there's lots of red flags that you learn to look out for is really what I'm saying here. And so some of these red flags really started to appear later on down the road. Uh, when I started seeing some statements being made that were just increasing in vitriol, uh, this situation has not died down. These people are not uh, moving on to get the job of the divorce done and move forward with their lives. No, there's a clinging to the break and to seeking vindication over, you know, the, the circumstances of the breakup and involving the children in the conflict in ways that, again, to me as an attorney dealing with accusations that often come out of these types of highly emotionally charged scenarios, uh, this is a big red flag type of scenario to be involving the children and, uh, basically putting the children in that triangulated position against the parent who is uh, being cast as the wrongdoer. So while I was seeing some red flags just from the reporting about this situation, my perspective on it really underwent a massive shift in February of 2022. You might remember that at that point in time, we are just getting ready for that Depp versus Heard trial. And uh, those of you who followed that journey through the roaring rapids of that case uh, may remember when this first came out, because what happened was that Johan Griffith filed for a permanent domestic violence restraining order against Alice Evans. And there were a number of parallels with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard situation. First off, and just explicitly out there, Johan Griffith alleged under oath that Alice had threatened him that if he left her, she would do to him what Amber Heard did to Johnny Depp. Johan Griffith supported his TRO, uh, initial TRO application with more than 100 pages of text messages, emails, uh, recorded conversations, the types of things that, again, are going to ring a bell for you if you if you followed that Depp versus Heard case. And, of course, you'll remember that there was a very publicly presented uh, story of that relationship and the reason for its breakdown that really fell apart once those recordings of Amber Heard engaged in the act of, you know, verbally, emotionally abusing Johnny Depp right before our eyes uh, were made public. And so very much like that situation, uh, this documentation that Johan Griffith submitted was really a game changer. He had been largely silent for the entire past year of <laughs> this breakdown where he's being viciously attacked in the press as some kind of soulless monster who abandoned his wife and children uh, and basically endured uh, all, all of this belittlement in, in silence. So this domestic violence restraining order application spoke very loudly for him. And to me, <laughs> it's very significant when you do that in court, when you uh, let your legal process do the speaking for you uh, rather than, you know, the, the Daily Mail or, or TMZ. Now, if you've been involved in a court process of your own, then you know that getting the court to decide anything can take a ridiculous amount of time. Things get kicked down the road. People aren't available. The court is very busy. And so because of this, at least in part, uh, most disputes like this, they get resolved informally. People figure out a way to work it out. Uh, the court is not going to make a quick knee-jerk decision about something like, how are you going to share custody of your children? So people 
inevitably wind up having to kind of work out those things for themselves. The court will just push it back on them to figure out a way to deal with it, which is very frustrating for a lot of people in the family law system, I'm quite sure. But that being the reality of the situation, I really didn't expect to see a lot more come of this. Uh, I figured this was going to be in the nature of a wake-up call. Uh, it's a big escalation. Uh, domestic violence restraining order can have a lot of legal consequences, which we're going to be talking about in some future videos. So my expectation was... You know, if we're dealing with a, a rational actor here, uh, if we're dealing with somebody who is getting and receiving good legal advice, uh, there's just going to be a, a shift now. Uh, we're going to see less of these public statements. Uh, we're going to see kind of a cooling off of, of the divorce. Um, they're going to be able to come closer to an, an agreement that may not make everybody happy, but at least is going to allow them to function as co-parents to their children. But little did I know that that was not to be. And so it was just last month that we got the news that finally dragged me <laughs> into the morass of this case. And that was learning that Alice Evans had been criminally charged with two counts of violating the domestic violence restraining order. She had been summoned into court, failed to appear, and as a result, a bench warrant was issued for her arrest. Well, this catches my attention for a lot of reasons, obviously, because kind of shows that my expectations about who, what, where, and why of this family process uh, might not be so accurate. We might not be dealing with average, normal people dealing with their disputes. Criminal charges are a big deal. Domestic violence criminal charges have a lot of effects. It's something that you really want to avoid uh, if you're in the middle of a contested custody issue. We're going to get into that as well. Uh, but most notably, it really caught my attention just because of how unusual it is. It is so unusual for a woman to face criminal consequences for acts of domestic violence, which this will constitute, and we'll talk about that. And certainly for, although, you know, not obviously the biggest Hollywood celebrity ever, uh, nevertheless, an affluent, educated, upper middle to upper class white woman to be threatened with jail in L.A. County, uh, that, that is quite unusual. Uh, so th th this was an attention getter to me. So I went and finally got the file and uh, decided to educate myself about what is really going on here and share it with you. So the reason why I think this case is an important one for us to talk about is because, like I said up front, this is much more of an average person's experience, an average man's experience of domestic violence uh, in a relationship than what we saw from, from Johnny Depp. Um, I'm certainly not trying to minimize Johnny Depp's experience. It was extreme in many ways. The man had his finger chopped off. Uh, but of course, Johnny also has resources. He has other houses he can go stay in. He has friends that he can reach out to. He has connections in the industry. He has a lot of protective factors uh, available to him that people who aren't in the private jet class aren't going to be able to uh, to to access. So this is a little bit more of a real world perspective on how these situations work. We're going to get some really good insight into litigation strategies and behaviors. How have these people conducted themselves in the course of this case and what sort of consequences has that had? Uh, there are very different strategies that Alice and Yuan have taken here. 
Uh, and so we're, we're going to look at the extent to which these are good strategies to employ and the extent to which these are destructive, self-destructive and destructive to others. Um, the last thing is that there are also some, from my perspective, interesting substantive legal issues to look at here, the law of domestic violence. We're going to be looking at the interactions between domestic violence, criminal courts, criminal accusations, and custody disputes. We're going to be looking at some of the bigger philosophical issues that come into play when you're talking about child custody at all. The conflict between parental rights, having a, a fundamental due process based right to parent your children, uh, against the state's interest as what's called parents patriae in protecting the well-being of children and in making decisions, custody-related decisions, that are based on the best interests of the children. And we're going to look at how parental alienation remains a very difficult issue for the courts to handle, in part because of these conflicts and the challenges of recognizing and remediating the trauma that is inflicted upon a child when they are placed in the middle of a high conflict situation uh, involving the parents. So I wanted to give you this kind of 10,000 foot introduction to the case to mainly let you know why this caught my attention, why this is a case that interests me and has topics that I think are important and worth discussing. So in the next video, we're going to start moving into the deep dive phase of the coverage of this case. And we're going to look specifically at the DVRO uh, proceedings. We're going to look at the process, how it unfolded. We're going to look at the allegations, the evidence that supported them. Uh, and we're also going to look at some of the strategic decisions that were made in the course of that litigation and the downstream consequences that we are beginning to see and are likely to see in the future as a result of those decisions. So if dealing with a high conflict divorce with allegations of abuse is a topic that interests you, well, I hope you'll stick around and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.